Good afternoon, everyone. I'm delighted to welcome you to the first research exchange talk of the year. My name is Camille Crittenden. I'm deputy director of Citrus and very pleased to have you here. I want to welcome our audience that's here in the Banatow Auditorium in person. And I also want to greet our remote audiences. We have web viewing set up at the other Citrus campuses at UC Merced, Davis, and Santa Cruz. So we're really delighted to have people participating remotely as well. Uh, glad that you can join us for lunch as it happens today. I think everything, uh, all your garbage can be thrown in the compost bin. I always have to give the warning about the foil on other days, but today, today you're all good. I want to make a few announcements about some upcoming events um, related to the talk today. The Institute for Transportation Studies has a regular weekly seminar on Friday afternoons. Um, this year it's being held in the Hearst Memorial Mining Building. I think there are flyers about it on the back table there, um, so please join them at 4 p.m. this Friday. Citrus, as you might know, also has a, a startup incubator called the Foundry. And it's been in existence for about a year and a half now, and we're welcoming uh, applications for new companies, for new startups. The deadline to apply is September 15th. So there's a flyer about that in the back as well. You can also look it up online, um, what the requirements are. But we would love, if you're thinking about new ideas for startup companies, um, for Citrus to be able to help you um, bring, bring those <laughs> ideas to life. There's a hackathon, a really exciting um, UC-wide, but even beyond UC, uh, hackathon that's being hosted October 3rd through the 5th here at the Memorial Stadium called Cal Hacks. It's gonna be an incredible, huge event. Citrus is a co-sponsor, but there are a whole range of other co-sponsors as well. Um, so if you have an idea about something you'd like to develop over a weekend, um, take a look at the requirements for that too. Um, just one last announcement about the Big Ideas Contest. Uh, Citrus also participates in sponsoring the IT um, in the Interest of Society category for Big Ideas. This is a terrific program that's run through the Blum Center just right across the courtyard here on campus. Um, and I also direct the Data and Democracy Initiative and we also sponsor the categories in public open data and in human rights. So I think there are six or seven categories overall. So check those out if you have thoughts about that. With that, I'll conclude the announcement portion of the introduction and move right on to introducing our esteemed speaker this afternoon. Daniel Sperling is Professor of Civil Engineering and Environmental Science and Policy and Founding Director of the Institute of Transportation Studies at UC Davis. He's led ITS Davis to international prominence by building strong partnerships with industry, government, and the environmental community integrating interdisciplinary research and education programs and connecting research with public outreach and education. In June 2013, he was named a recipient of the Blue Planet Prize from the Asahi Glass Foundation. The prize has been described as the Nobel Prize for Environmental Sciences. He was recognized for his unique ability to bring together these various constituencies that I described, top thinkers and strategists in academia, government, and industry to develop new vehicle and fuels policy approaches that are models for the world. Sperling is an international expert on transportation technology, fuels, and policy with a focus on energy and the environment. You'll hear some of his new ideas in the presentation this afternoon. His research is directed at accelerating the global transition to cleaner, more efficient transportation and energy and mitigating climate change. These are all concerns of Citrus as well as many other departments and research centers on campus. So please join me in welcoming speaker Daniel Sperling. Thank you. It really is a pleasure to be back here. I did my graduate studies here at UC Berkeley, and I did a talk to Citrus about five or six years ago. So uh, this is a great time, uh, and it's very fun for me to be back here. So. This is, I want to start out by saying this is really an exciting time for all of you involved in all the different types of technologies associated with Citrus. And for those of us, so I work on the interface between energy and transportation. Both of those are becoming even more and more exciting, you know, very interesting areas to work on. I was talking to Praveen Varaya, we were talking about for many years, especially in transportation, it felt like we were toiling in the desert. And if you go back a little further, much of my early career in the energy area, 
I would have said the same thing. But a lot is happening now. And so the question really, so I'm going to focus on transportation particularly and talk about some of these big changes that are about to happen, starting to happen. Uh, what do they mean for transportation? What do they mean for us as users? What, do we mean, what does it mean for our society, the environment? And I do want to focus a little bit on the role of policy and the role of universities. It's not, that's what I'm really, really personally very interested in, but I'm going to set the stage and perhaps in our discussion we can follow up on that. I've become really a policy wonk in recent years. Uh, and so everything I talk about, what I'm really interested in is how can we formulate policy that will steer the transportation, the new technologies, the new services in a way that really is in the interest of society because a lot of it could go in a very different direction. So, you know, some of these transforming transportation, you know, this idea has been around for, uh, you know, there's been lots of creative thoughts over the years. Uh, so some of you a little older will remember the Jetsons. And actually this image is from an automated car back in the 1950s. So you have, they're playing some kind of board game. So there has been great advan huge advances in transportation, especially from the early to mid 1800s through about the mid 1900s. So I'm going to focus on passenger travel. Freight is a little different. I'll make a few references to it, but I'm going to talk about passenger mostly. So in passenger, we've seen huge progress, a lot of change. You know, we've, you know, this is the early years of the car and roads. The interstate highway system, which started to be built in the 1950s. And in some ways, this is where we've ended up in transportation. And this is real. You know, if you know, a lot of, it, probably in this audience, you, you know, that wouldn't surprise you, but you could go to many parts of the world and they would just not believe that there could be such a massive amount of concrete <laughs> being built in a city to serve cars. So, what we've ended up with is what I'll call the hegemony of, of the car. In many ways, the car has vanquished transit. We like to think about, you know, we see buses around, we see the BART system. Um, but in fact, if you look at it, bigger picture, in the United States, only about 3% of passenger travel is by transit. And the rest is by cars and then planes for inner city. So transit has really shrunk, plays really, uh, out, outside of the center cities, it plays a very small small role. And we have to acknowledge it all started here in California, the car-centric transportation systems, car-centric lifestyles, car-centric cities. Of course, I always say, well, it was really Southern California, but... Uh, <laughs> and here's an image I like that kind of characterizes where we've ended up. This is a person in their SUV, um, walking their dog, <laughs> driving their dog. And just so you don't think this is just a California or American phenomena, I was at MIT recently <laughs> and someone gave me this photo <laughs> where someone was walking their camel <laughs> from their uh, truck. Well, it could be that they couldn't put it inside. <laughs> <laughs> I'm more, uh, there's always creative ones in an academic audience. <laughs> So we are in the midst of an automotive boom. We are motorizing transportation. So what's happened in the United States, in Cal which started in California, is now spreading to the rest of the world. Not now, it has been spreading to the rest of the world. And this is a graph from a book I did a number of years ago. Uh, and you can see, this is a graph of how many vehicles there are in the world, motorized vehicles there are in the world. And, you know, the numbers are kind of interesting. We're at about 1.2, 1.3 billion vehicle, motorized vehicles in the world. But what's really shocking about it is the slope of that curve. 
So if we think we have problems now with pollution, energy use, climate change, it's only going to get a lot worse unless we do something very different. So part of what's happening now is to serve all of those vehicles, we have to dig up a lot more fuel out of the ground, under the ocean, fossil energy to power them. So these are three images just to give you a sense of what this means. It, we used to be, there was this oil well spindle top in Texas and you got a, one oil well, you got 100,000 barrels out of it per day, but those days are long gone. So now energy companies are looking much further afield and much deeper underground. So here you see, this is the oil sands uh, uh, mine at, is the main, uh, you know, this is all, it's about six miles long in Canada. Whoops. Um, this, whoops, sorry. And, and this is a, uh, a uh, shale gas, shale oil facility. This is deep, uh, deep water in the Arctic that's being built. So um, this is where we're headed. And technology is advancing, the energy area is advancing very fast, making it possible to get all that fossil energy out at a pretty low cost, at least financial cost. <coughs> so this car-centric model we have is very expensive. This is a emaciated uh, uh, piggy bank from all the, uh, we're, we're <laughs> borrowing from the piggy bank here. So about, for the world, about a fourth of all the greenhouse gases are from transportation, about half the urban air pollution. It's actually considerably higher in California, both of those percentages. Uh, Two-thirds of the oil is from, uh, is used for transportation. And we have this huge infrastructure cost. Remember that image in, in LA with all those freeways. That's billions of dollars right there. And another way of putting it is the average cost of owning and operating a vehicle in the U.S. today is $9,000 per year. That's full cost, depreciation, operating costs, parking, everything. And so we've created this transportation system that, as I said, with, there was a lot of change and innovation that took place. I'd say up until about the middle of the 20th century. Since that time, we've seen innovation in the, in the artifacts, in the pieces of the technology. The car is much more, is much safer, much more comfortable. But basically our transportation system in a functional sense, in a system sense, has not changed <coughs> in many, many decades. Think about our vehicles. Four wheels, still run on petroleum, combustion engines, same speed, same carrying capacity, roads basically <laughs> unchanged for all these years. We have more of the limited access roads, but basically the, the functioning of our roads is, is very similar to what it's been for a very long time. All roads serve all vehicles. We don't have hardly any specialization of vehicles. Almost all roads are free. Transit also is functionally unchanged. We do have modern rail systems that came into being starting, starting with BART in the 1970s. Um, but almost all of our services are fixed route, fixed schedule. Even the bus and rail vehicles are functionally unchanged. They have air conditioning. That's been the big innovation in them in, in the last 50 years. We have almost no demand responsive services even though here, you know, with Citrus and all the researchers associated with it is working on all of these, the internet of things and, you know, so much more in terms of information technologies and so on. We have very few intermodal transfers. You get in your car, you go where you're going, that's the trip. And I would say, so just a, a little digression, the freight system has seen much more innovation. They do use the information communication technologies a lot. You can track your UPS package wherever it is. Um, containerization 
transform the whole freight industry. So now there is all the intermodal transfers from trucks and rail and ship and plane. So freight is a different story, but we're focusing on, on passenger travel here. To quote Albert Einstein, we can't solve our problems with the same thinking we use when we create them. So we need to start thinking about transportation in a very different way. Okay, here's my, uh, my, inno my own personal innovation here. I have a little animation here. So what happened is, so I have a little personal story. And in many ways, it's what's inspired my newfound interest in a lot of the changes that are taking place in transportation. So I lived up in the Berkeley Hills here for many years. That's my little black Prius out front from about five or six years ago. And, uh, and so I lived up there, had a car, top of the hill, now, as you know, it's pretty steep up there, but you, so you have to use a bicycle to go anywhere. You can't walk. There's nowhere to walk. There's, you can't bicycle for sure because it's so steep. And so it's, it was, even though it's, you know, right, the whole, all the Berkeley Hills, it's very car-centric. So a, few, a number of years ago, I moved to Davis, which I should have done much sooner. And... Uh, Bought a house right in downtown Davis. See there, I ride my bike now. And, and it's in downtown Davis. And so I can use the bike for almost ev biking or walking almost everywhere to my office, re restaurants. And then I can use bus. And as I'll talk about in a moment, I have car sharing right nearby. I have car rentals nearby. And now the new Uber services are available. So I'm here to make a vow. Just yesterday morning with my wife, we said, OK, we are going carless. She says it's a one-year experiment. <laughs> <laughs> I was, you know, she's from Southern California, so that was a really big deal uh, for her. But um, we've gotten to the point. I'm going to describe why it really is possible now in ways it was never, and of course, being in Davis and downtown. Um, but, you know, the, there are, I'm sure, how many people are carless in this crowd? Yeah, see, look at that. Wow, that's impressive. All right, that was like about a fourth of you. I'm, I'm, I'm in, now I'm really inspired. <laughs> so what I'm going to talk about is this, the, a set of three different revolutions taking place in transportation that are really at different stages that are uh, going are already and are going to be transforming it. The, the one that I've worked on for many, many years is the electrification of vehicles. And that's uh, started with the hybrids and then moved to the battery electrics, plug-in hybrids, and, and coming soon is the fuel, our fuel cells, hydrogen fuel cell vehicles. The other one is the sharing economy that's finally coming to transportation, finally in the sense of all these information communication technologies are now really starting to be used to enhance, create new services, and you know, I can't help but note Susan Shaheen, one of my former students that I'm so proud of and a faculty member here, is really the, the, the global leader in, in working in this area. So I'm a little, you know, a little nervous about that part of this, but I can still go back to my electrification part and feel comfortable. And then, and then the third one, which hasn't really started yet, is the automation of vehicles, driverless vehicles. And there's a few of you in the crowd here that know that we work here at UC Berkeley. We led an effort back in the early 90s uh, with driverless cars led by the PATH program. And, uh, but now it looks like it's finally going to happen. So out of all this, if you look at it from a business industry perspective, there's a huge number of business opportunities, all kinds of opportunities for startup companies, established companies. But what interests me especially and concerns me is that many of these revolutions can lead us to a much better world. And I have to confess I'm kind of a half, a half full glass kind of person. And so I do see things a little more optimistically. Um, but in this case, there are things that 
could greatly undermine the, the potential benefits and even have negative effects. So we really need, so the role of policy is really central to these transformations to make sure they evolve in a way that bring the most uh, social good. So if I look first at the electrification revolution, this is a number of vehicles in the world, plug-in electric vehicles, plug-in hybrids, as well as uh, pure electric vehicles. And so the number, numbers looks big, but actually it's, it's pretty small compared to the total number of vehicles in the world. There's about 80 million vehicles sold every year. So it's really a tiny fraction of that. But it is expanding, as you can see the size is expanding uh, quickly. In California, we do have very aggressive policies to support the transition to, to, to plug-in electric vehicles and uh, fuel cell vehicles. So these are, so part of my intro or part of my bio is that I serve, I'm a board member in addition to being academic, I say the academic job is my day job and my uh, moonlighting job is I serve on the board of the California Air Resources Board and we're the ones that are adopting all the policies and regulations uh, affecting energy use and especially climate change uh, uh, in California. There's a lot of others doing energy, but we're the primary ones for climate policies. And so the policy, the rule that's in place requires car companies to ramp up the number of vehicles they sell so that it will be about 15% of sales in 2025, representing about 250,000 vehicles per year in California. And there are a lot of other states that are follow have adopted that same zero emission vehicle mandate that we have. Now, y y there's a question of how fast this is going to go because there's some that are very optimistic. Um, and here's a graph that was done by McKinsey and Company, and they say they show, you know, that's where current condition. This was actually two years ago, so this has probably moved over. So this represents the cost of batteries, which is the key factor variable in determining the, the success of electric vehicles. And you can see it's still along, you know, it, it's still not competitive with the internal combustion engine vehicles. Uh, but Elon Musk, God bless him, he's even, he, he doesn't even think about half full, it's 99% it's full, I think. <laughs> um, he's talking about the price of batteries dropping to $100, you know, building his gigafactory. Um, We'll see about that, but in any case, the, ba the cost of batteries is coming down, and so they are becoming more plausible. But what's happening is conventional vehicle technology is improving, you know, in many ways just as fast. So every vehicle that, every new model of vehicle that comes out, so every four or five years, is about 25% more energy efficient than the previous one, which is really extraordinary. For those of us that are a little older, we remember you know, that book I wrote, Two Billion Cars, it was inspired because I was so angry at the automobile industry, so frustrated because they were blocking every new policy or rule that would have increased the fuel consumption, improved the fuel efficiency. Well, that's changed. That's one of, part of this revolution here. Vehicles are becoming extraordinarily, uh, or uh, they're, go they're heading in a direction being very extraordinary energy efficient, but they're improving about four or five percent every year. So, but with the electric vehicle, so, so I, I mention that because even electric vehicles, electric vehicles are inevitable that there's going to be a lot of them, but it could be very slow or it could be very fast. And left to the marketplace right now, even with the aggressive uh, policies in place, electric vehicles are probably gonna happen very slowly unless we come up with even more policies or better policies or more incentives. But there's a lot of creativity happening. So China, they have 180 million electric vehicles. 180 million. They're electric bikes and electric scooters and they're not full-size cars. But that's really extraordinary by itself. And there's a lot of new ideas. So this is a paper I did a couple, a few years ago with a friend of mine from Harvard, Richard Foreman, and we talked about 
start with a blank sheet. You can think of a transportation system where we can build roads much lighter weight. We don't need those big concrete uh, trestles and, and, and roads that are being built everywhere. If we had lighter vehicles and, and we specialized the use of the roads, we could build, uh, build roads that are very lightweight, very inexpensive, lightweight vehicles that go on them. They could be electrified. Uh, they could have inductive coupling on the, on the roads and a little battery for when they go off the, the main roads. So you can imagine this. And actually, from an economic perspective, if you were starting from scratch, it would make a lot of sense. But of course, we're not. And so it's probably not going to happen, except in maybe some uh, special situations. So what we're talking about is a very uncertain future, how this is going to play out with electric, all kinds of electric vehicles defined in lots of different ways. There's like one of the ideas is Siemens, the big German uh, technology company, is demonstrating trucks that run with overhead catenaries, you know, kind of like the trolley trolleys in San Francisco, except the, the one lane is for trucks, and it has an overhead wire, and it runs on electricity that way. And then you don't have the battery problem. So there's lots of, I'm, I mentioned these because there's lots of opportunity for innovation. Some of it's happening, some of it's not. <laughs> so what we need is a new policy framework for guiding these technologies in a way that is in the interest of society. So one of the ideas that I'm particularly focused on or starting to get focused on and interested in, we have this very elaborate system of regulating the fuel economy of vehicles and greenhouse gases, the national CAFE standards. But in a few years, they're going to be anachronistic. They're going to be almost useless because all they do is measure the energy out of the tailpipe from the engine. But soon, most of the emissions are going to be upstream from electricity, from biofuels, from hydrogen, and none of that is captured in this very elaborate regulatory system that's been created over a period of 40 years, 50 years. So we need, we're going to have to transform that. And any of you involved with policy and government, you know, um, this is going to be really hard and difficult, but it has to be done. And it will be done just because it has to be. We need transitional incentives and rules. You know, we provide high uh, HOV carpool lane access for electric vehicles, which is a great incentive uh, for people to buy them. We have zero emission vehicle mandate. We have, we're starting to build hydrogen infrastructure. The state legislature is now funding, uh, providing about $20 million a year to build hydrogen stations in California. So we're going to see more of those. We're going to see fuel cell cars that use them. But we need durable policies. Because what I've also learned, being on both sides of the fence now, having spent time in Sacramento on the government side and dealing with industry a lot, is that they need a lot of certainty. The worst thing is this regulatory uncertainty or policy uncertainty, because they're making huge investments that are very long-lasting investments, whether it's oil companies or car companies, electricity companies. So we need a much better way of providing that overall policy structure to guide these changes in the right direction. And you, you, know, you might say, well, carbon taxes is probably one of the best and is one of the best policies. But even that by itself would not come nearly close enough to accomplishing the kind of changes and to make sure things are going in the right direction. They'd have to be so huge uh, to accomplish that that they would never be politically acceptable. They're not even politically acceptable when they're that big. Uh, so um, we need these. So uh, some of the ideas I've been playing with and that are starting to percolate around are the idea of fee baits. Actually, that came out of a graduate student work with uh, uh, a woman, Debbie Gordon, that worked with Art Rosenfeld 25 years ago for her master's thesis here in, at the Goldman School. And she first laid it out. It's the idea of you buy a car. If it's a gas guzzler, you pay a big fee. If it's very efficient, you get a rebate. That way, it's uh, revenue neutral, no cost to taxpayers. And it sends market signals to the customer and to the industry. So anyway, there's a lot of ideas out there, some, of them, some good ideas. And we need a lot more. So bringing it back to the university side, the other, what I've been 
really committing myself to and trying to create at Davis, we've created a real culture within our research community, the, the ones I'm involved with, the energy and transportation centers, to really get people focused on what research, how can they slightly modify their research in a way that's really going to have value for the decision makers, especially the government decision makers. Because we in, in the university, you know, we do what seems interesting to us and we'd like to do things that are, have value to society, but we really don't understand it and we don't have a good communication with the government leaders. And so, you know, one of the things I'm committing the rest of my career to is bridging that chasm so that we make sure the research we do is useful and of course on the government side they have to learn how to work with us too and so it takes a lot of effort but I you know I mentioned this theme because for Citrus I would you know urge you to redouble efforts to really make that connection with the policy world. So number two Susan Shaheen's transformation Okay, new mobility options. So, oh, um, just looked at the clock. I get so excited that I digress here. But okay, I'll speed it up a little. Okay, so, because I do want to have an interaction. So, new mobility options. This is really exciting. There's all kinds, of, for the first time, so Susan, when she was a graduate student with me, pioneered the use of smart car sharing, working with, uh, at that time, uh, uh, Merce uh, Mercedes and Honda. But now there's so much more going on. And we have, I mean, one way of thinking about it is, is creating demand responsive services. And in the old jitneys from Mission, Mission Street in San Francisco make them, you know, bring them into the modern era with real time information. And there are companies starting up these jitneys, shuttle services that are real time. Uber, which you probably have heard about more than any of these, is, I think, I mean, Uber is controversial. Just read in the paper today that Germany, a judge in Germany told them they can't operate in Germany. Um, they said they're going to do it anyway, which is kind of interesting. But um, they're, from, they're from Silicon Valley, right? You know, they know what's right. Uh, so, but there's this whole, and Uber is just one. There's a whole suite of, company, a lot of companies out there starting to become very innovative, creating these kinds of services. There's smart carpooling services, you know, we used to call it dynamic ride sharing. Um, and, and, and even car sharing has become even more smart, so now there's one-way car sharing. Mercedes and BMW now operate car sharing services where you just take the vehicle, you drive it, and then just leave it where you are. And, and then someone gets it there, and it all, you know, now with GPS and all the information available, it's, it's doable. So, um, and there's all kinds of reasons why these services, there's, you know, I get in arguments all the time that, you know, all Uber is just replacing taxis. Well, at the first stage, that is exactly right, but it opens up a whole new set of opportunities. And in the end, what it really means is reducing our ownership of vehicles because now we have this whole suite of services. So, okay, to bring it back to me, so living in Davis now, I have a zip card that's just a, a block away from me. Uber is now, Uber and Lyft have both come into Davis. Um, I bike, I walk, I have the train. And so it's much more complicated. You know, we've become accustomed in the United States that, that you know, our car, first of all, car is a right, but also we value the, our freedom and our flexibility so much, or at least we think we do, that we aren't, haven't even been willing to consider the putting a little extra effort into making these choices where we can combine, do these intermodal connections, look at what, are, what is available, because in the end, uh, if I was emperor, unfortunately I'm not, <laughs> you know, I could take that $9,000 and I could guarantee that almost, almost everyone could receive all the transportation they want for much less than 9000 So in many cases, it, it'll be a little less convenient, but it would be considerably cheaper. And so for some people, you would, you would pay the 9000 and you'd get higher quality service. Um, than what you have now. 
and I could go elaborate into it, but there's so, so many benefits that come from having the access to different services. You don't have to worry about parking, get access to more vehicles, uh, economics. Okay, so we can talk about Uber and Lyft. I think, so taxis are in big trouble. In the end, what's going to happen is taxis are going to get more regulated. I mean, taxis are going to become less regulated. They're way over-regulated now. I mean, every little uh, action, you know, the paint on their car, everything is regulated. It's way over-regulated. There'll be deregulated or, or less regulation. There'll be more regulation for these other services. Um, and we'll see how that plays out. Automating vehicles. Um, this is not a new idea. I mentioned earlier, you know, the PATH program here was work had, that's actually an image on the left side there, was running platoons of cars in San Diego, you know, almost 20 years ago. General Motors came out with these, these are prototypes, but automated electric cars using gyroscopes, small little cars that they think of as good urban cars. Um, and automation is actually already here. There's a Mercedes, a new Mercedes that's coming out, the S-Class and also the E-Class. They will, at speeds less than 37 miles per hour, less than 50 kilometers per hour, they will steer, brake, and accelerate by themselves. You don't have to do anything. They'll, they'll drive. Uh, and it only costs $2,800. So. <laughs> on, yeah, all right, on top of it, right, yeah, yeah. Well, you, this is how things, you know, happen, right? <laughs> all right, so the, uh, so automation has lots of um, potential benefits. Vehicles are safer, it gives access to people that can't otherwise drive, saves time, we can text, you know, without, you know, killing ourselves. Uh, we can make the vehicles more energy efficient. They can drive in platoons right behind each other, reduce the aerodynamic drag. But in the end, you're really making driving much more, much easier. And so left to itself, if we really had truly automated cars, driverless cars, we would have a lot more driving. People would live in Davis and drive to Berkeley and vice versa, or even Tahoe and just work in the car. So you can imagine all kinds of scenarios where it would uh, have some, you know, from a societal perspective, very negative effects. And I have to mention Google, because Google is very interesting. They, uh, they've, in a sense, tied these three revolutions together. Because this little car they have, it's a little neighborhood car, what they're proposing to uh, build build those, it's an electric car, it's going to be in a car sharing arrangement, and it's automated. Now, it's a, it ties them all together, but it's probably not a very successful business model, or it's not likely to be very successful because it's a low speed car, uh, it can only go on certain roads, but it does suggest, you know, a path into the future. And so kind of a last major thought I want is, uh, is the idea of tying the transportation revolution into the larger built environment. So my institute and a cluster of institutes that I'm involved with, my, our Energy Institute, a Policy Institute, and a few others, we all clustered together at UC Davis a new development that was built uh, on campus land. It's called West Village and zero net energy. And, and it's a and it, and it accomplishes that with a lot of solar energy and a lot of energy efficiency, plus a, has a biodigester and a few other little things. And that's where we're located. So it kind of, it's exciting to me because it's part of living the dream or living the future, but it's also a challenge is how do we now take that building revolution that's really happening on the building side. Buildings are becoming much more energy efficient, just like the vehicles are. And now we need to start bringing it together. And that's one of the big challenges uh, going forward. So uh, just to summarize, there's a couple, a few themes here that I've, I've tried to introduce to you. And that is we really need some way of bringing these different 
services and innovations in, at the same time. No, in, on the transportation side, no one service, no one new technology mobility service can compete against the car by itself, other than as a niche product. But if we have a number of services, like I was describing for myself and Davis, then I'm willing to give up the car. And then what I'm doing is, I'm taking that fixed expense of the car and converting it into variable cost. So now when I make a choice of traveling, I'm paying the full cost of that trip. As, to oppose, as opposed to when I own the car, you know, the marginal cost is so small that I just get in the car and go, you know, go somewhere. I'm just paying for the gas or the parking. And, and so we make a lot more trips than is socially desirably, social ra socially rational. But we need policy to in encourage all of these choices and, uh, and, and direct them in the, in the right direction. And as I've come to appreciate in the universities, we have so much expertise and barely any of it is getting, making its way to Sacramento and Washington and, and, uh, and government in general. And so I, I really want to emphasize that we really, it's our responsibility to try to bridge that chasm and to make sure, I mean, don't we all want our research to have an impact? And so it takes more resources and more effort to do it. We can't just evaluate professors on how many papers they've written there has to be a way of providing the incentives and encouraging more of that uh, interaction. And so that's the idea of creating an engaged culture, leveraging our expertise. We need strong communications, that's one of the other. I spent a year at a think tank in Washington, D.C., and I was stunned. You know, at think tanks, you know, Brookings, all these, they get so much attention, they seem to be so effective. And what I found out is they have, they, they spend something like a quarter of their entire budget, their staff, for communications, for facilitating, convening. They're doing hardly any research. And so I'm not saying that's, that's what we should aspire to, <laughs> but it does should open our eyes to that we can do a much better job of communicating. So I do, this is the, you know, I do believe fundamentally that we humans are very innovative and creative, but we need to have be focused, focused our intellectual energies and our resources, and then we're going to do great things. But we need to focus it, and that's where policies come in, and that's where there's a role for universities. Thank you very much. So if you have any questions, please use the mic here. Uh, <coughs> I've noticed in many of the discussions of transportation there's one factor that was actually mentioned in an MIT article over 40 years ago, but which still, uh, I think, requires some thought, and that is that the cost uh, of the time of the people is usually set at zero. And by not including uh, what it costs a person, it is time and energy, uh, we wind up with very funny things. And I'd like you to comment on putting in the cost to the person of his time? Well, in the transportation profession, we, 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 we do. You know, if you look at, go to Caltrans, you know, mo when they calculate, when they determine where to build a road and what kind of road, two-thirds of the, when they look at costs and benefits, something like two-thirds of all the benefits are the, or, or more, more than that, is just the sa uh, time savings. So that's how they justify these investments. But, you know, the, the, the larger point is, is correct. And, you know, in fact, it's that point that really has been the argument used for automating vehicles. You know, an old friend of mine, Larry Burns, an, another UC Davis graduate, worked for GM, and he goes around, he calculates how much we value our time, $15, $30 an hour on average, and says, you know, if I'm in the car and I don't, and, I, and that time's available to me, it's a lot of money. So it's a good point. Early in your talk, um, you introduced um, an idea that was very rad or uh, an idea that was very radical as far as real estate, and that is that having a, car, a house with a beautiful view isn't such a wonderful um, attribute. You gave up the presumed value of views in the Berkeley Hills. I presume the views in Davis are not quite the same, and it doesn't really matter. 
Well, the, the house is a lot cheaper, and I think that's, uh, <laughs> that, that makes me feel better about losing the view. <laughs> but there is aesthetics involved in this. And, and you know, part of this is we have to understand behavior much better than we do. You know, people, on the one hand, go through a life cycle. So in, in many of the ideas I'm talking to fit best with young people and older people. You know, the, the, I guess us baby boomers, a few years ago, we had all our kids and, you know, whoever, I guess it's the millennials raising the kids now, starting to raise kids. So uh, we have to appreciate that. And we have to appreciate everyone's different. So. I'm from Europe, and uh, you started a lot of uh, saying a lot about policy making and this development with too many cars. So, what is preventing the policy here to have a more modern passenger rail system? Because we have a very dispersed land use system. We've dispersed our, so we built up so much of our country around the car that, you know, all, all of suburbia, many of our cities, many of our cities, they just don't fit with a fixed route type, you know, fixed guideway type system. And because you have to get, you know, no one is close to the stations. And so part of what we can do though is, I mean, we could revive some of the rail and conventional transit services by using the information technology, creating these services that can make it easier for people to access and egress, you know, the first mile, last mile thing. So. Um, that's part of this. Th that is part of this story, is I is trying to accomplish part of that. Hi, uh, I come from Singapore. Uh, in the Asian context, taxi is one common mode of transportation, and it also employs employs a lot of people. For example, in Singapore, most of the drivers are Singaporeans. It employs employs a lot of people. So, could you comment on the new mobility solutions? versus taxi, so if you di we destroy taxi, we destroy a lot of jobs. In that perspective, could you further comment on that? Well, we're not going to, I mean, if taxis were destroyed, it really would just transfer those jobs to other kinds of services. So like Uber and Lyft, they already employ, I don't know, Susan, how many drivers do they employ now? It's hundreds of thousands, I think, right? Yeah, they're already employing hundreds of thousands of drivers. In fact, I have grad students, they drive down, okay, here's, maybe this is not such a good story. <laughs> <laughs> and this is why, this is why you have to hold your nose a little bit in the beginning as you're making these transitions and kind of stay focused on the long term. So I have grad students, they come to San Francisco on Friday and Saturday night and drive Uber and Lyft, provide Uber and Lyft services because peop, there's a lot, that's when the demand apparently is highest. And they go there just to make some extra cash. They just drive their cars. So in fact, what we're, we are creating, an, okay, so I digress a little on this because it's an interesting point. We do have the risk also from a societal, social perspective of creating this huge number of people working at relatively low salary jobs. And they, you know, I don't even think these drivers, so I've been using Uber and Lyft a lot. So I interview all the drivers. They don't understand, they don't appreciate how little money they're making. You know, they, they say, wow, I get $1,000 a week. And then, well, then they pay 200 to Uber, then they pay 200 for gas. And, you know, and then, they, you know, they, have, they don't fully calculate how much the cost of owning and operating their car is, insurance. So um, this is an example of where we do need some oversight and regulation. Uh, but it'll generate lots of jobs. <laughs> Maybe not great jobs, but um, yes. So I've actually, I've got two questions, two things that I was hoping to comment on. The first one is when you were talking about your shift from the Berkeley Hills where you traded your view into Davis where you were downtown. Um, another uh, big difference there is the size of those cities. And in Davis, you can get around all of the whole town on a bike. Um, in Berkeley, you can't, you couldn't do that. Or you could, but it's a much bigger commitment. So I was wondering if you could comment on what you see how size plays into it. Um, and then also, in terms of equity and electrification of vehicles, um, right now, um, the policies that are in place to promote electric vehicles um, tend to use rate payer funds that are going to go to, but the only people who can really take advantage tend to be high on the income spectrum. So how can you, like, what would be a good way to make sure that 
everybody is benefiting, or at least that there's that equity is being considered and. Um, well, yeah. and that's a great question. There's lots. Of, I mean, one simple thing is my fee bait idea, is that <coughs> we shouldn't. Okay, I I, I should be careful because I'm the one voting and making the decision. But um, in my personal opinion, <laughs> we shouldn't have taxpayer money going for that. We should create something like a fee bait where people that are buying that Mercedes S-Class <laughs> are paying the extra fees that are used to subsidize, you know, to cross-subsidize. And it's not taxpayer money, and it's sending the right signal. As for size, I think Berkeley, you know, Berkeley, the, apart from the hilly part, <laughs> maybe I guess if you start using electric bikes, that might be more doable. But I don't think size is a problem. You, I mean, you got the BART system, you got the buses, so, uh, and it's not that big. I mean, I, I ride two miles to work. Um, you can get two miles is a long ways in Berkeley. So I think that that's a great thing, you know, about creating these. And it's not for everyone. You know, that's the point I'm trying to say. Create a whole, the, a whole set of choices. What's more American than that, right? Having choice. And that's what we need is more choice. We don't, that's kind of one of my themes is the hegemony of the car. We don't have choice anymore. And we've got to create choice. Yes. Dan, I wonder if you would comment on the infrastructure implications. You showed the highway system and talked about how we're very car centric. Um, clearly an accessible community like West Village or New York City uh, where you can get around a lot uh, reduces the amount of infrastructure. I, I recently saw a study in New York where they looked at two million taxi rides and said that if those people, each of those individuals were willing to share with one other person, they could reduce the taxi fleet by 40%, and if they were self-driving cars, they could reduce it by 80%. Would you comment on the infrastructure implications? Um, the road infrastructure? Yes. Well, I think in the United States we have, I mean, for the, the answer to the question for the United States is, we've got the road infrastructure, we're not gonna build essentially not going to build anymore. And so a lot of what we're talking about is how to use the, the infrastructure more efficiently. I mean, just look in Berkeley, you know, I just haven't been here in a while, and all the bike lanes and, you know, they've, you know, redesigned a lot of the roads and trying to allow more choice with bikes in that way. So I, think, I don't think it's really, there's going to be much of an infrastructure issue for the U.S. For places like China or India or Indonesia, yeah, there it's huge because they still, they haven't built that huge web of, <laughs> of, of uh, interstate freeways with HOV flyover lanes and so on. So there, there is a huge infrastructure, and we can save a lot. And pr you know, in the suburbs in Southern California, there is a lot. Some, um, you know, they are still building some infrastructure, and I think there's a way of not building it and saving, using that money, diverting that money, into supporting these kinds of services that provide a lot of other benefits. Thank you. Uh, I work on electric vehicle technology, so I'm curious what you see the uh, policy role of uh, funding incentivizing the establishment of uh, the EV charging network to uh, you know, make adoption easier, and how are we doing so far? Where should we go? That's, you know, that's a great question and, and we're really struggling to try to understand. So I have a whole team of people trying to answer that exact question in terms of, you know, how many of these uh, different charging, fast charging versus 220 volt charging, where do you want them? I think what we've learned, one of the things we have learned is home charging is by far the most important. That's where people do it. Um, a little bit of fast charging. <coughs> you know, between cities. I just drove up I-5 and saw the Teslas being charged at Harris Ranch. There were about five of them there. Uh, and because it's perfect for them, you know, because you only need one stop to get to LA and they just stop there for a half hour and do it. So a lot of it is how do people, again, it comes back to behavior. How are people making choices? So we've got the early adopters and we kind of understand the early adopters but we don't know as we move into the more mainstream how much security do they need in terms of having these charging out there to f make them feel comfortable. And workplace, it turns out workplace charging is probably the most other, the first is home and then workplace because then you just charge up at work and you know, you've got plenty of charge. 
Um, I know this is not your end game, but I'm interested in fuel cell vehicles. And uh, I recall being around industry people as long ago as 20 years ago, where they saw fuel cell vehicles as just around the corner. And, uh, and still is. And still is. That's <laughs> my question. Is how, how far away is that corner? I, I think we're very close to that. Um, the, you know, through all these years, the car companies have, ma many of them have maintained a very strong interest in fuel cells. They kept putting money in it. They've been improving it. They brought the cost down. Just uh, six months ago, I was in the Toyota uh, R&D facilities in Japan, and they had, they literally had hundreds of engineers working on the fuel cell. And so there's been a lot put into it. Th I think it's really come to the point of building up the hydrogen infrastructure. They're ready, they're ready to go. So as I said, California just is committing taxpayer money to getting it started, but we've got to figure out a way. In, in that case, Toyota actually, I should say, put in a little bit of money into that. But the oil companies have resisted um, and that's a whole nother story I could get into, but have resisted, and that's been a real problem uh, in terms of getting companies to invest in the infrastructure. So that's the big challenge. It's starting in California, in Germ Germany, California, and to some extent J Japan are starting to build up hydrogen networks. It's gonna be slow though, because you build up the network slowly and it's gonna take time, but I think we're there. I think it's, it's happening this time. So we have time for one more question. Yeah, you're the expert on electric vehicles, and I think you've worked with Dr. Burke up there a little bit, who works on supercapacitors. Um, yeah, he's 84 years old, and he says yeah, this is the most exciting time of his life. He, yeah. can't, he can't bear to, give up, to retire. He's a piece <laughs> of work. Um, my question for you, aren't we pulling, pulling the wool a little bit over the eyes of the public on um, batteries? I, I don't know a lot, but I worked years ago on them at GM, and just the basic um, chemistry and physics of batteries, when it gets really cold, you talk about charging in the garage. I mean, how many people here have lived in the Midwest or the East Coast when your garage in the winter is maybe zero or 10 above? They don't charge very well. The, the capacity of the batteries goes down by 50%. Um, you know, what about supercharging and destroying, um, warping the plates and, you know, the life? And, you know, that's, isn't it really a kind of a niche technology to be, be honest with the public? I suspect for the United States, the way it's going to play out, there'll be a moderate number of pure electric, battery electric cars, mostly in, in the city, dense cities and a few other places. And the rest will be either plug-in hybrids or fuel cell cars. And th that's probably the big question in my mind is how that's going to play out. And the plug-in hybrids is even a big question. You know, BMW has a car coming out, the i3, and it has a hundred mile or so range. And then they put for an extra, I think $3,000, you can get a little motorcycle engine that'll give you an extra 80 miles of range, you know, low power, but fast, you know, good enough for the freeway uh, to go on it. And so this is part of the behavior side is, I mean, you're right, it's not, it's not well suited to the really cold weather. It's not suited to long distance. We're, we're pushing the vault on you, which is a <laughs> plug-in hybrid. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much.